um, a little bit of ground since I wasn't expecting to lose two full lectures to snow. Um, so we're basically going to put some of that quantum mechanics stuff that we were talking about in, um, into, into practice and kind of turn it into um, some skills that we can actually take away from this and some generalizations we can make about the periodic table and why it's shaped the way it is. Um, so, do I need any nails? Here we go. So let's recap where we kind of left off with these, with uh, talking about electrons. T today's, today's lecture is pretty much going to be all about electrons. And then we'll get to applying some of that to the periodic table because it turns out the periodic table in general is shaped the way it is and the elements behave the way they do, mostly due to electrons. Um, protons too, to some extent, but remember by changing the number of protons, we change what element something is. And by changing electrons, it can still be the same element. So different elements changing number of electrons is most of chemical reactions are just moving electrons from one atom to another atom or changing how they're structured around um, the same atom even. Even if you don't move the electrons to a different um, element, you can change the physical and, and um, chemical properties by moving electrons between energy levels. Um, so this is kind of where we left off. I'm, I jumped one slide. We talked about electrons being specifically in different energy levels. They can exist in shelf A or shelf B and not in between, right? They had that weird property that if you want to move a book from shelf A to shelf B, you can move it and it can, you know, it might have to put extra energy in, but you could hold it in between shelf A and shelf B, right? But electrons don't do that. If you want to move an electron to, from shelf one to shelf two, you it literally ceases to exist in one spot and begins existing in another spot. There is no possibility of having those electrons in between the energy levels. And that, that realization is really what, what led Niels Bohr to be one of the leaders in, in early quantum mechanics research um, was he realized and he kind of had to make a pretty big leap to do this um, Basically, what, what Bohr was able to realize is that there was um, certain wavelengths of light. Let's see if I can get this. No, I'm not going to try and do this one off the top of my head. Let me pull up the equation because this one is not one we use that often. Rydberg. So the Rydberg formula... was this idea that if you look at the wavelengths of light that hydrogen can, can give off, the wavelength of light is represented by this Greek letter. We talked about um, wavelength as a variable yet. Okay, so this one over the wavelength is equal to a constant times one over n squared minus one over n uh, second n squared, a different n squared. Um, and so what they, they could figure this out that light, the only light that was that was emitted or absorbed by hydrogen had wavelengths where the only numbers you could plug in this equation, n1 and n2, had to be integers. Didn't matter what integers, but they had to be integers, which was weird. Um, and this is this comes from the fact that you can't put an electron on in between shelf one and shelf two. Those shelves, those bookshelves, are what they call principal quantum numbers. And so Niels Bohr looked at this equation that a guy named Rydberg had published. There's some sort of weird update. Now. Keyboard shortcuts aren't working. It's not opening Google Sheets anymore or uh, Google Slides. So basically, the Bohr model of an atom is based that these electrons don't really exist in, in true orbits. They exist in energy levels. And those energy levels are what, in our analogy, are the, the different shelves that you could put a book on. 
Um, and so the Bohr model is this idea, okay, you've got your nucleus in the middle. So it's still following the nuclear model where you've got all of your positive charges and all your mass is in this tiny little fragment in the middle. Uh, and then the electrons take up all the space around that. And if you want to move an electron from one energy level to another energy level, you have to put energy in. Or if it, if it goes from a high energy level to a lower energy level, you have to take energy out somehow. And you can't exist in between the, those energy levels. And so they call that the that N. Uh, it's represented as a capital N there, but that's an autocorrect issue. Lowercase N is the principal quantum number. number. Principal quantum number. Does anybody know what quantum means besides being a buzzword and, and being vaguely confusing? That's how we think of it now. That's what it's come to mean. Originally, it just meant that it was an integer number. A quantum was a discrete packet of energy, a quantum of energy. Um, and if you had multiple packets of energy, they called it quanta. Quanta was, is the plural of quantum. Um, it just means that it's a discrete object, it means that you don't can't have a part of a quantum. So basically, it's quantum means it can only exist at shelf A or shelf B and not in between. Um, now it's come to mean we talk about things in being in the, the quantum scale, um, or if you watch Ant-Man in the quantum realm and things like that. Rules are different when you're at that scale. So now quantum means something totally different than it used to. It originally just meant that things behave like the Bohr model. The electrons, at, when you get that small, things are limited into what the possible outcomes are. You can't have just any energy that you might want. Um, and this is still one that's, it, the Bohr model is not perfect, but it's still a decent representation of how things work. And it kind of, it is kind of hits the sweet spot for most people. Um, if you're not going into, um, if you're not going to be a science major or a physics or a chemistry major, the Bohr model is a pretty good approximation. That's about as much detail as most people will ever need to know about how electrons work and how atoms are structured. Um, we talked about the difference between the, the uh, sizes of the nucleus in terms of mass, right? We said that the mass of a proton is about 2000 times greater than the mass of an electron. Um, one of my favorite analogies, we talk about this, the difference in volume. Um, the nucleus is pretty tiny in terms of volume. It's huge in terms of mass. It's tiny in terms of volume. Um, to give you a picture of this, so almost all of the mass of an atom is in the nucleus. But the size of a nucleus is if you, who here has gone to a professional baseball game? So picture the Oakland Coliseum or... Pac Bell Park, or whatever it is now, Oracle Park. That was the throwback. It hasn't been Pac Bell in a while. Um, picture holding a baseball on the pitcher's mound. The baseball is the size of, of the nucleus. The rest of the stadium is the size of the electrons. So the electrons take up almost all of the space, but have next to zero of the mass within sig figs. Um, and part of that really low mass and being really, really small is what gives those electrons that specific um, property of being able to behave like a wave and a particle at the same time. Uh, in fact, you heard, has anybody heard of the, the two slit experiment? I think I, for brevity's sake, for this class, I cut out the, uh, the background on the two slit experiment for light. When they're first trying to prove whether light was a particle or a wave, um, they basically took a, a light source and they shine the light through at a wall that had two really small gaps in it. So if they, well, first they did it with one gap. And what they found is when you shine light through that, you get sort of like a cone of light when you measure out the other side. And when I say cone, it basically, you got a, a bright spot in the middle and then it gradually fades out, kind of like you would expect, right? If you shine a flashlight at a wall, you get a bright spot and then it gets dimmer 
as it goes out, right? If you did this with two slits, though, you don't just get two bright spots over here. You actually get an interference pattern that looks like waves canceling each other out, where you get double bright spots in some spots that are twice as bright as they should be, in some spots where there's no light, where there should be light. And so that that basically proved that these these were photons were acting as waves and canceling each other out. Um, so the thing is that you can actually do this experiment with electrons too. If you fire electrons, instead of having a light source, if you fire electrons at a two slit setup, you can measure where the electrons hit. And the electrons we know are particles. We know that they have mass that we can measure and that they're discrete objects. But when you fire electrons, at, the, at a two-slit experiment like this, turns out they behave like waves. They interfere with each other and cause those similar interference patterns where you get constructive interference or a double bright spot in some spot in some places and where they cancel each other out in other places. Um, which is weird because how can a single particle that's going to approach this and is going to pick one of these at random to pass through and then depending on which of these it goes through, we would expect it either hit up top or down below, right? Except what you actually see is that electrons interfere with themselves. They behave like a wave, even though they're definitely a particle, um, which is just kind of wild. Um, unless you measure which slit it goes through. If you actually change the experiment, instead of just measuring where it hits over here, if you actually set it up to measure which of the two holes the electron passes through, it actually behaves like a particle and it doesn't interfere with itself anymore. The act of measuring where an electron goes changes how it behaves. Um, in other words, electrons are like a pouting toddler. When you ask them to do something, well, now I'm not going to do it. Has everybody seen the meme with the, with the claymation penguin? That's an electron. Electrons basically behave like particles when you measure where they're going, but they behave like waves when you just measure where they end up. Does anybody know what principle or what law um, kind of gives a meaning to that or gives a name to that? You can't know both know where it's going or where it is at the same time. Does that sound familiar at all? There's some built-in uncertainty. Who had who had uh, a principle named after them that was all about uncertainty? No, nobody. Heisenberg uncertainty principle doesn't ring any bells. So Heisenberg, the leader of the the Nazi Manhattan version of the Manhattan Project, his Nobel Prize was for what's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, which was basically that your uncertainty, which is represented with this Greek letter sigma, in where a particle is, times the uncertainty in the particle's momentum, will always be greater than or equal to h bar over 2, I believe, where h is a constant. In other words, you can know where something is and you can or you can know how fast it's going, but you can't know both at the same time. And the more accurately you know where it is, the less accurately you know its momentum. Turns out this applies to everything. But electrons are really the only thing we deal with on a regular basis that's small enough for this to matter. Turns out H is a really, really small number. I want to say it's. It's on your equation sheets, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, I think. And that's going to be in units of, I think, uh, joules times seconds. Yeah, joules times seconds. That's not all that important, but what this means is even though everything has to obey this uncertainty principle, you can apply this idea to every, anything, any matter. It only really matters when you get something small enough that its uncertainty winds up being significant relative to how small this number is. So really just for electrons.
Um, although, interestingly enough, anthropology has their own uncertainty principle. Um, the uncertainty principle in anthropology, it, so in, if we put this not in mathematical terms, the act of measuring the system changes the system. Right, the way when I had the drawing of the two slit experiment, I said, oh, well, you change the experiment and then it changes how the electrons behave, right? Anthro in anthropology, which is a study of, of human cultures, um, the way that they think about this is you can't actually know anything about some, some perfect isolated village that's never met the outside world. You can't know anything about them without changing their culture. Yeah, if you go in there and try to observe that culture, you're going to change the culture. Maybe they weren't aware of the existence of the outside world until they met you. Or maybe if you even try to stay, you know, um, unseen by them, maybe they notice your tracks or a wrapper that you drop or something like that. And that changes the whole system. Have you ever seen The Gods Must Be Crazy? Has anybody seen that movie before? One person. It's the teacher. Um, if you haven't, I think it's free on YouTube. The original Gods Must Be Crazy, it's about a, a um, tribe of Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert that discover a Coca-Cola bottle, a glass Coca-Cola bottle, and it changes their world because they've never seen anything that's this hard, and they use it for, as a tool for everything now, but then they start fighting over it because there's only one of them. Um, if that sounds familiar, that's the movie is The Gods Must Be Crazy, and that illustrates the same principle applied to anthropology instead of electrons. Um, which I think is kind of interesting. There's really nothing in like physics at a larger scale that has the uncertainty principle, but if you get to anthropology, it shows up again. All right. So when I said that the, that N, that energy level is also called the principal quantum number, that implies the existence of other quantum numbers, doesn't it? Um, which you may not have heard before or may not understand what a quantum number is. Um, but a quantum number is basically just a number that allows you to solve an equation that solves for the energy of those electrons. Those electrons that can only exist at certain energy levels. How do we know what those energy levels are? We basically plug in a bunch of numbers and only certain values of those numbers allow you to solve for a real value. So N is that principal quantum number. And that's the one that, that Bohr was aware of. But it turns out that if you zoom in far enough, N equals two has sub levels. It has other energy levels that are close to N equals two, but there are other sets of numbers you can plug in that give you still allow you to solve for a real value. Um, and when I say solve for a real value, everybody remembers trying to solve the quadratic equation for a person that doesn't actually cross the x-axis. Does that sound familiar? If you try to, quadratic equation solves for, for the roots of a parabola, right? So it's, you can solve for those two numbers if you plug, plug the equation into the quadratic equation. Um, if you, what happens if you try to use the quadratic equation for a parabola that doesn't cross the x-axis? There's no solution. You wind up trying to take the square root of a negative number. You can't take the square root of a negative number. You get an imaginary result, right? It's basically, if you try to plug in 1.5 for n, when you into the equations that, that predict the energy of the electrons, if you try to plug in a number that's non-integer, you get an imaginary result. You wind up trying to take the square root of a negative. He's a better teacher than I am. I just let awesome. things ring. Hey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we have a principal quantum number, those sublevels that we can still plug in and get a real answer for this, um, There's three of them. There's M. No, there's, let's see, there's L, then there's M sub L, and then there's M sub S. So here's our primary number, our principal quantum number. This is called the 
and I always try to do this from memory and I never come up with the right names because it doesn't really matter what they're called. We'll explain what they mean in a second. Um, basically, this is the type of orbital, or sorry, type of energy level of the defined orbital before I use that term. Um, and this is sort of like the, the direction it's pointed spatially. And this one, this last one is called spin. And we'll talk about what all three of these other um, energy types mean, energy levels mean. So because of because Niels Bohr was the first one who kind of put this together and he said that these electrons behave like an elect um, like a satellite orbiting um, a planet, he called those different energy levels orbitals. And so an orbital is really just is a function where if you plug in the right values of the quantum numbers, so these are our quantum numbers. And the orbital is the function that you get that kind of shows you the shape of, of where you can find these electrons. So it turns out that they don't just behave like they're perfect little satellites orbiting. They behave like a wave, right? But waves have shape to them. If you think spatially of a wave in the ocean, it has up and down, right? It has direction to it. It has the direction it's moving and it has um, above the surface of the water and below the surface of the water, right? That has a function associated with it, which you could think of that as being the orbital of that wave. We don't typically only use the term orbital to represent electronic functions. Um, but that effectively, the orbital is where you're going to find an electron. What does it look like when it behaves as a wave? Right, and so for the different types of orbitals, when we plug in different values in for these quantum numbers, we get different shapes of functions. So the simplest one are what are called S orbitals. And S orbitals are basically if L equals zero, when L equals zero, you get a shape that just looks like a sphere. It's not truly a sphere. If I zoom in, you can see that it's this sphere, it's, it's supposed to represent a sphere cut in half. So you can see a cross section it has a little red dot in the middle. So it's not a true sphere. It's basically like, if you think of, if I turned a, um, if I start thinking in spherical coordinates, has anybody done in polar coordinates in math? What are the variables? You don't use X and Y, right? You use what? Theta, which is the angle, and radius, which is the distance. So basically, an s orbital is has a uh, more or less a constant shape, no matter what angle you're looking at it. It's got the same shape, but it has this weird little um, this weird wave shape when it goes from being red to being blue as you go from the, the origin, that's r equals zero, to whatever the outside of the sphere is, whatever the distance the outside of the sphere is. Basically, all I'm saying is it's it looks like a sphere, but it's a, it's like a sphere that has a wave built into it, which is weird. We're going to have to start thinking in more than three dimensions, which is really hard. I'm going to do my best to kind of explain things. It's really cool, but it's also really kind of... Um, I think mind numbing is actually, it's not mind numbing like it's boring, it's mind numbing as in it's really, really complicated. Mind, mind boggling maybe, better description. So these S orbitals look like a sphere. Um, but if we plug in a different value, if we, instead of plugging in a zero for here, if we plug in a one, we can actually get this shape that kind of looks like a figure eight. Would, that we call a p orbital. 
thing is, we can't just have a pure. So, I, and basically, what this is going to mean is that our inner type of energy level, our type of orbital, is going to be governed by what types of um, L values we can have that, that solve allow us to solve this function properly. Why does this matter? Because it turns out the shape of the periodic table is governed by the rules for what possible values you can have for each of these energies, for each of these uh, quantum numbers. <clears throat> So let's talk about what the rules are. What are the possibilities here? N is our principal quantum number. And the only real rule for N is that it has to be an integer. Other than that, you can have an N value for, that can be whatever you want, as long as it's an integer, positive integer. For L though, the types of orbitals you have, in each energy level, you can only have um, any any integer value that's between zero and n minus one. So for energy level, if, if we plug in the first energy level, if n equals one, how many possible values do we have for L? Just one, what is it? Zero. If n equals one, L can only be zero, which means you can only have an S orbital. You can only have that sphere shape. What about if n equals two? If n equals two, L could be zero still, or L could be one, which means in the second energy level, there's two suborbitals. There's an S orbital and a P orbital. Well, how does this track back to the periodic table? Look at the shape at the rows on the periodic table. N corresponds to what row in the periodic table you're in. For the first row of the periodic table, there's only two elements, right? That doesn't even really look like a row. It's just hydrogen and helium by themselves. You only have two elements in the first row of the periodic table because the first energy level only has an S orbital. And an S orbital can only fit two electrons in it. The second row of the periodic table still has an S orbital. We call that the S block is the first two columns of the periodic table. The, the second row of the periodic table can have an S orbital, which is why it has, elect, it has elements in the S block, lithium and beryllium. But then it also has six elements off to the right, in what we call the P block. So n equals one just has an s orbital. n equals two has an s orbital and a p orbital. n equals three, how many possible values are there for L? Three. Every time we go up one energy level, we add a new type of orbital that we can have. And so the, what energy level we're talking about governs the shapes of the elements, uh, shapes of the electrons and how they behave. Um, M sub L is basically, if you look at these, um, these figure eights, these representations of the P orbitals. You've got one that's up and down, one that's left and right, one that's front and back. Three different orientations, right? Turns out M sub L is basically which direction things are facing. And M sub L can go from negative L to zero to plus L. So how many values are there for M sub L if we're talking about L equals zero? How many possible values are there here? If L is zero, you can only have M sub L can only be zero, right? Basically, there's only one way that you can orient a sphere. A sphere is always going to be oriented as a sphere. If you turn it around, it's symmetrical, right? No matter which way you rotate it. So there's only one way you can orient it. So there's only one possible value you can put in here, which means 
that limits how many electrons an s orbital can hold. If you can only have one value here, your s orbital can only hold two, two electrons. Okay, so and let me, so I, we have this up here. Um, L equals zero, that's an s orbital. And that's a, looks like a sphere. If L equals one, call that a P orbital. Oh, and that looks like a figure eight. If L equals one, how many values are there for M sub L? <laughs> Negative one, zero, positive one, right? Which corresponds to up and down, left and right, front and back. So we have three sub sub orbitals for a p orbital, right? And they're kind of all kind of on top of each other. We represent them as being separate. They're really kind of all exist simultaneously in the same space. So it kind of looks like if you can picture a figure eight that's going up and down, figure eight that's going left and right, and a figure eight that's coming out of the board towards us and going behind the board into the board and out of the board. Basically picture those three bottom figures overlaid on top of each other. The fact that we have more values for M sub L means that P orbital can hold more electrons. So an S orbital only had one value here and it could hold two electrons. A P orbital has three values here. How many, how many electrons can a p orbital hold? Six, which is why the p block on the periodic table is six elements across. That big chunk that starts with boron on the top left and then goes down to 118 on the bottom right, that's the p block. And it's six elements across because a p orbital can hold six electrons. What do we go get if we go up one more level? If we if n equals three, we get a new value for L, a new possibility for L, right? Anybody know what we call it? SPD. Very good. A D orbital has an even more complicated shape. It looks more like a, almost like a, a clover leaf. I can never quite get it right the first time. It basically looks like two figure eights overlaid on top of each other and, and it gets more complicated in terms of the overall shape. We'll look up a representation here in a minute to show you a picture. How many electrons can a D, a D orbital hold? 10, how do you know that? I double, it goes two to, six to 10, we added two more values of, of M sub L, right? Now we can go minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. I didn't think that through, starting counting um, while I was holding that. <clears throat> Basically, every time we go up an energy level, we get a new type of orbital. And every new type of orbital has two extra values that we can plug in here, which means it can hold four more electrons every time we go up an energy level. So where's the D block on the periodic table? Does anybody know? The, yeah, it's the one part we usually call the transition metals, right? And if you count them starting at scandium, going across to zinc, how many elements do you think we'll find? 10, that bottom chunk, that's not usually written as being part of the periodic table. That's kind of off by itself at the bottom. That's called the F block. That's what we get when L equals three. How many electrons can that hold? 14. We can get, if L equals three, we can go from minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three. Seven possible values here. 
for a total of 14 electrons, which is why those bottom two col those bottom two rows are 14 elements across. Right. So the shape of the periodic table is entirely dictated by these quantum numbers. This last one, this is actually, it's one of the weirdest ones, but it's actually one of the easiest as well. Um, this is called spin. What are the possible values for spin? Does anybody know? It actually doesn't have anything to do with the rest of these, but it's the reason why each of these values can hold two electrons. It's either plus one half or it's minus one half are the only two values you can plug in for spin that give you a, a, a real answer. So in other words, and we usually just call these spin up and spin down. And which is, these are the reason why when we draw out electrons, a lot of times um, we'll just see them drawn as arrows up and down. And so this might not be, and I'll go back a second and explain this in more detail. But for basically for every one of these lines represents one solution to Schrodinger's equation basically one set of values for these top three quantum numbers. Every single one of these lines that we draw, sometimes you see them drawn as boxes, um, but effectively what we're seeing here is the y-axis up and down is energy. The lowest energy possibilities are the ones with the smallest values for all of your quantum numbers here. And we represent that with a line, and then that line, we can put in two electrons, one as an arrow facing upward, pointing upward, and one that's an arrow pointing downward. Basically, that's just saying things can be, you can fit two electrons in each of these energies at each of these solutions. Um, it's called spin. It's not really physically spinning, though. Uh, it's... Mathematically, the way this function works is it looks a little bit like if you tried spinning a basketball on your finger, you could spin it clockwise or counterclockwise, right? You could put the same amount of energy into it either direction, right? Which means you could get the same energy in that basketball spinning by putting in a positive number or a negative number. So... It's not actually spinning. Electrons aren't actually a basketball. But mathematically, the function looks a lot like the mathematical physics function for a spinning basketball. So because the mathematical function is shaped the same, even though it's not physically spinning, we call it spin. But to try to avoid people getting confused too late um, by the idea that they're not really spinning, we use up and down because things don't really spin up or spin down. They spin left or right, usually from our normal frame of reference. Um, so the, but I don't, they basically, a lot of times theoretical physicists will try and use words that have everyday meaning, but then use them in a way that they can't be mixed up with their everyday meaning. Um, if you look at, at the way that they name quarks, different types of quarks, um, which are the smaller subatomic particle that's, particle that's smaller than a proton or a neutron. Um, the different types of quarks, they name them um, as different flavors. And the different flavors of quark are like, there's six of them. It's like up, down, strange, um, lemon. It's, they're like really weird names um, that basically like you, you're talking about quarks, you can't be using those words the same way you would in everyday life because it wouldn't make, you couldn't make a sentence that makes sense um, the way that they're used. Things don't spin up or spin down, but electrons are spin up or spin down. Um, I don't know, it's, it's weird. Um, and I think sometimes theoretical physicists just get really, really, really high and name things. Um, and that's their prerogative. They probably had to be high to think of some of this stuff. You ask Carl Sagan. Does everybody know who Carl Sagan is? Uh, we, we've reached this. The, does everybody know who Neil deGrasse is? 
Neil deGrasse's teacher was Carl Sagan, his PI when he was in grad school. Carl Sagan was a much better science educator and less of a general dick than Neil deGrasse. Um, still felt very strongly about things, but was a much kinder person. Um, probably because his favorite hobby on the weekends was going and getting baked. Uh, he was a big advocate for legalizing marijuana back in the 80s before anybody else even thought about that when the war on drugs was still like just getting started. Carl Sagan was using pen names and writing into newspapers about how, how dumb it was and how they shouldn't be doing any of that. Nobody in here is old enough to go out and get baked yet, though. So please don't. I'm not advocating that in any way, shape or form. But it does kind of explain some of the names that theoretical physicists come up with sometimes. That's all I'm saying. All right, if we want to know, back on subject here, if we want to know how, how we can represent these, like, okay, I kind of gave you some, some rules for mathematically what are possible values here. Um, and what's really limiting these, the fact that L can only exist to N minus one, if you tried to plug in too big of a value for L, you don't get a real answer from your equation. When I say the equation, the equation we're plugging this into um, is Schrodinger's equation. Which is basically, and that's the same Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat. Um, Schrodinger's equation is basically the, the function that governs what the possible energies are for an electron. The really simplified version is there's a mathematical operator called the Hamiltonian that we represent with this H with, they, they literally call this character um, H hat because um, it looks like H has a hat on it. H hat times the Greek letter psi, which represents the wave function, which is a matrix where every single row of the matrix represents um, an electron is equal to the energy as a function of the wave function. What does that mean? Not a whole lot to you, understandably. But these quantum numbers are the values that you plug in to, for the wave function that allow this to be true. Schrodinger proved that this equation exists and he, he proved the shape of it basically. And then all the different possible numbers that you can plug in that give you a real energy out of this function that's what these quantum numbers are. And if you try to plug in a number that doesn't work, if you try to plug in N equals one and L equals two, you get a non-real answer. You get an answer that's like taking the square root of, an, of a negative number where you get an error out of your calculator. So how, to, how does that apply to this class? I'm not gonna ask you to solve any of that. I want you to understand kind of vaguely what these principal quantum numbers are, but more importantly, we're gonna apply it to the periodic table and use the periodic table to allow us to describe the energies relative to each other of these different sets of quantum numbers. And the way we do that is using what are called electron configurations. Have you talked about electron configurations in the past? 1s2, 2s2, that's, some of you, yes, some less so. Well, don't worry, we'll translate it here in a second. Um, when we're trying to figure out what state these different electrons are in, what are the most likely solutions to Schrodinger's equation? We basically start from the lowest energy configurations and work our way up. All right, and that, that actually comes, there's a German name for that called the Aufbau Principle or Aufbau Prinzip, um, which literally just means build from the bottom up in German. It means you start with the base. You start with the lowest energy possible configuration, lowest possible energy configuration, and you put electrons in it. And then when you build up your lowest energy state, if you still have more electrons, you put them into the next highest energy level. Basically, this just means start at the bottom, work your way up. What that looks like 
in practice is that these lines that represent the different energy levels or, or the different solutions to Schrodinger's equation, I'll actually draw in the y-axis here. When you plug in n equals one and L equals zero and M sub L equals zero, you get an energy out of the, the uh, Schrodinger equation. That energy value, there are two possible electrons that can have that energy value at any given time. You could have an electron spin up or an electron spin down. The shorthand for this, this n equals one, l equals zero, m sub l equals zero, is just one s. 1s, 1 is the principal quantum number, s is the type of orbital, and the type of orbital tells you how many possibilities there are here. So if we're going to go up to another energy level, higher energy level, if we had n equals 2, there are now two possibilities here, right? We could have 0 or we could have 1. We could have an s orbital or we could have a slightly higher configuration called a p orbital. So an s orbital, even though it's the second energy level, we still can only have a zero. If we have zero for L, we can still only have zero for M sub L. So there's only one line, one possible place. We can put a spin up and a spin down electron. How many lines do we get to draw if it's a p orbital? Well, if it's n equals 2, l equals 1, m sub l could be negative 1, 0, or plus 1, right? There are three possibilities here. So we get to draw three lines, each of which can hold two electrons. If we added that many electrons in, now we filled our second energy level. Basically, the off-bow princ principle is you start at the bottom, you start filling in arrows, two arrows per line or per box, until you run out of electrons. They're always going to go in the same order. It always goes 1s, 2s, 2p, and then you go to the third energy level. How does that translate to the periodic table? You get the first row. The row is your principal quantum number. The block is the type of orbital. And how wide the block is tells you how many lines there are. So what do we get after 2p? What happens when you get to the end of the second row in the p block? We finished that, that row, right? there are no more possible L values for N equals two. So we wind up going to the third energy level. What's the lowest energy value we could plug in for L? Be zero again, right? And L equals zero, what type of orbital are we talking about? An S. What's the first thing you see on the periodic table on the third row? You're back in the S block again, right? When you get past neon, neon is the end of 2P. When you go past neon, you're in the third energy level and you're in the S block. And every S orbital can hold the same number of electrons, which is two. Basically, you don't have to memorize the order 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3 or 4s, 3d. It gets a little bit weird. It's the same every time, though. These energy levels go in the same order no matter what. And all we do to write the electron configurations is we start at the bottom and you fill these boxes in until you run out of electrons.
and the periodic table tells you what order to do it in if you know how to read it. All right, so if I gave you, if I drew one of these uh, atomic orbital diagrams, we should be able to look at it and see and figure out how many electrons and, and therefore what element we're talking about. So let's say we have this many electrons. What element, if it's neutral, what element corresponds with this many electrons? Nitrogen. It's got a total of seven electrons. So if it's neutral, it's got to be nitrogen. Basically, this tells us if you have an, a single atom of, of nitrogen, this is going to be the shape of the electrons and the energies where you can find electrons. Um, the shorthand for this, since you don't want to have to draw this out every time you do an electron configuration, the shorthand is basically you say what orbital you're talking about, and then you say how many electrons are in it. So for nitrogen, the electron configuration is your 1s orbital has two electrons in it. Your 2s orbital has two electrons in it. What comes after the 2s orbital? 2p. And how many electrons are going to be in the 2p orbital? For nitrogen, it's three. If you don't have this drawn in front of you, the way to write your electron configuration is you just count on the periodic table. You count on the periodic table till you get to the right number of electrons. And every and the shape of the periodic table tells you what order these go in. So what about phosphorus? What would the electron configuration look like for phosphorus? Well, phosphorus is in the third energy level, but we're still gonna start from the lowest energy and build our way up, right? So how do we start? 1s2, we always start with 1s2. Everything starts with 1s2. The only atom that doesn't have, doesn't start with 1s2 is what? Hydrogen, because it's what? 1s1. It only has one electron, so you can't build up the orbit, that first um, s orbital. That finishes the first row of the periodic table. Now we're in the second row of the periodic table. Three and four are in the S block, right? So 2S2. We're still in the second row of the periodic table. You just follow along with the atomic numbers. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten are still in the second energy level. They're in the P block, and there's six of them. And what do we do once we fill the P block, the 2P? 3S2. Have we gotten to phosphorus yet? We just keep going until we get there, though. We're still in the third row. We move over to the P block and three elements in. So 3P3. So the reason that I keep coming back to the that the orbitals give the periodic table its shape. Where did the periodic table come from? Not who it was. It was Mendeleev, in case you don't remember the name. But what was he doing to make that shape? Yeah, he was just putting properties. That if they had similar properties, it went in the same column, right? The reason that they have the same similar properties is because both nitrogen and phosphorus have a half filled p orbital. They both are something P3. Selenium underneath, or sorry, um, arsenic underneath phosphorus has really similar chemical properties to phosphorus because it ends in 4P3. The fact that it has that whatever P3 gives it a lot of its chemical properties. So it's not that the shape of the periodic table is dictating this. It's more like orbitals are dictating the shape of the periodic table. That shape comes from principal quantum number and those rules that we went through, right? So 
Am I going to make you remember all of those rules for what are the possible values? No. What I am going to make you do is be able to do this if you have a periodic table in front of you. Because that has all those rules embedded in it. It has the fact that S orbital is going to hold two electrons built into the shape of the periodic table. And if you look at the periodic table that I'm going to give you on the test, fastest. periodic table that you're given, I forgot it was rotated here, actually has P block, S block, D block, and F block listed on it. S block, first two columns, and then it's the D block. So you don't even have to remember which block corresponds with anything that's even given to you. As long as you know how to read the periodic table, you can do this. Right? Very little memorizing involved. Memorize the process, I guess. But I'm not even going to make you come up with where the process comes from on the test. The whole point of these of all of these two full lectures on quantum mechanics is this, basically. And the fact that the periodic table shape comes from these rules that we skimmed over. Um, in uh, in college classes, we usually just call that hand waving. I just waved my hands and said, don't worry about the math. Just trust me that this is what it means. It's basically what we did for all those rules, right? The periodic table is the result of that. Um, this is just the names of the other rules that we kind of went through. Poly exclusion principle. By Wolfgang Pauli um, is the one who said that every electron, and actually I think he said every fermion, which is basically if you have anything that has a um, non-integer value for spin, you have to have a unique set of quantum numbers. Basically, you can't have two electrons that are both spin up and in the same orbital at the same time. So that's the effect of that is the fact that we can't just put all of our electrons into the 1s orbital. Once you fill the 1s orbital, you have to go to the next orbital. Is it not scrolling down now? There it is. Um, this is the one that I kind of blew right by for a second. Hund's rule, Friedrich Hund, came up with the the way of describing the fact that if you have orbitals, if you have lines that are the same energy, which typically anytime we're talking about um, the same orbital, so the, a P orbital has three lines we can draw that are all the same energy. A D orbital is gonna be five lines that are all the same energy within sig figs. You have to start by putting them all in the, um, we, we put one electron into each of these with matching spin before we start doubling up. And the way I like to think about that is it's kind of like if, if we're filling a school bus full of people um, that don't know each other, nobody's going to, nobody's going to sit down next to a stranger while there's still a completely empty seat right behind them, right? You're going to put one person in each seat before you start doubling up. Makes sense, right? That's basically what Hun's rule is saying. Before we start doubling up electrons, if we're gonna put three electrons into the 2P here, we do it like this. One electron each, and then if we needed to keep going, we would start doubling them up. Once all the empty school buses on the seat are on the seats on the school bus have at least one person in them, then you will start having two people per seat. And once again, not a perfect analogy, but it's, it's good enough. Um, and the reason for that is kind of cool. Um, it's 
basically, if you have a whole bunch of electrons with the same spin that are all unpaired, you actually get a favorable interaction between them. When I say favorable, I mean that it lowers the overall energy of the system. And the result of that is actually what causes magnetism. Magnetism is a result of unpaired electrons with the same spin, all oriented facing the same direction. If you do that, you generate a magnetic field. Um, and so it winds up being a lot more stable like this than putting them all together and matching the spin up first. Um, that's also why the strongest magnets wind up being uh, materials that have um, that have lots of f orbitals and d orbitals that can be exactly halfway filled. The strongest magnets are going to be exactly half filled f orbital half with a half filled d orbital will give you the absolute strongest magnets you can make. Which is kind of cool. At least I think it is. All right. So we're going to draw the electron configuration of carbon. Instead of just using the shorthand, we're going to fill in the electron energies, what would it look like? Where do I start for carbon? Start at the bottom, always, right? If it seems repetitive, it's because it's the same rules over and over again. How many electrons does carbon have when it's neutral? Total of six, right? Our first two of, of the six electrons, the first two are going to go in the 1s orbital. Are we done yet? No, we have four more electrons to add, right? So we go to the next energy level. They can hold two. There, now are we done? Still need two more, right? P orbital can hold six. We only need to put two more in there. How do we do it? It's going to be 2p2. We do it like that. Nope. Separate them first before you start doubling up. This is still not a perfect, um, a perfect way to think about electrons. Turns out there's even more weirdness that starts happening with these orbitals when we start forming bonds between different elements. Um, we'll talk about that when we start talking about covalent compounds. Um, and it still gets a little bit weird because how many different types of orbitals can we have in the third energy level? We could have, so remember, L can be 0 up to n minus 1, right? So if n is 3, L can be what? Be zero, can be one, can be two. That means there's three types of N of orbitals in the third energy level, right? How many types of orbitals are there in the third row of the periodic table? Just an S and a P, right? Where is that D orbital? Well, it turns out. When we, if we zoom in a little bit on the third and fourth energy level, let me erase the lower energy levels. We had 3s, 3p, and 3d. As you get higher and higher in the energy levels, the different, the distance in terms of energy between these gets bigger and bigger. And so there actually comes a point where the 4s energy level is actually lower than the 3d energy level. So even though three, the first d orbital belongs to n equals 3, it doesn't show up till the fourth row of the periodic table. You actually fill up 4s before you fill up 3d. So we're going to look at the electron configuration of arsenic. 
we're going to write it out, out the shorthand for it. So 33 electrons. How would we write that out? It's going to start the same way as the rest of them, right? So what? 1s2. Then 2s2. Keep going. 2p6. 3s2. 3p6. That gets us to argon, right? The next place we go is the fourth energy level and into the S block that can hold the two electrons. And then we get into the D block. The first D orbital though belongs to N equals three. So we, we do four S two, then it's three D 10. Followed by what? Now we're blocked back to the fourth energy level in the P block, and we need to put three electrons in it. So the reason why the periodic table is not, the, there's still a little bit we need to remember when it comes to knowing how to use the periodic table. You have to know that your D block is offset by one row from where it should be, according to the principal quantum number. And it turns out your F block is offset by two rows from where it should start. We have a similar thing happening with the F orbital. The first F orbital that we see, which is the top row is the pink row, the pastel pink row, uh, the lanthanides there. That's the 4F orbital, even though it shows up in the sixth row of the periodic table which is weird, but it's just because we have this offset where that F block is actually higher in energy than a bunch of the, the 5S and 6S electrons. All right, how much time do we have? Not too much. The other thing this allows us to do, the reason, so not only does this allow us to say, okay, well, everything in the same column is going to behave similarly, and this is why, it also allows us to predict certain properties pretty well. Basically, electrons are most stable, and therefore atoms are most stable when you have the either completely filled or completely empty orbitals and ideally completely filled energy levels or completely ener empty energy levels. So if we know what the electron configuration looks like, we can predict how many electrons something needs to gain or lose to become stable. And since stability, electronic stability is what kind of governs whether or not something will happen, we can say, okay, these are the only possible values for the charge on a certain element. So if we look at fluorine, 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 2p5. Is fluorine, what's the shortest number of steps we can take to make sure fluorine has either completely filled or completely empty orbitals? give it one extra electron, right? If we give fluorine one extra electron, it's got a completely filled highest energy level. Does anybody remember what the term is for the highest occupied energy level? You might not have heard it in those terms. What are the highest energy electrons in, a, in an atom? Valence. The valence, the valence shell or the valence energy level is just the highest energy level in an atom that has electrons in it. It's not the highest energy level, period, because there's all these empty energy levels up above, right? Those empty energy levels still exist, even if they don't have electrons in them. But the highest occupied energy level is called the valence level. And the electrons in that highest energy level are called the valence electrons. 
So fluorine, when it's neutral, has how many valence electrons? Well, look at the electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, when it's neutral. How many valence electrons does it have? Seven. Anything with a two in front of it is part of that highest energy level, highest occupied energy level. So that's seven valence electrons. To be stable, things either need to have to fill that valence shell or empty it. So when fluorine is stable, it's got a minus one charge. And now all of a sudden it has eight valence electrons. All right. Um, this didn't used to be a weird lecture for me, but I've now gotten used. My daughter's name is Valence, um, which oddly enough was not my idea. My wife's idea. My wife has a bio degree. We met in Ochem, um, and she came up with the idea of naming our daughter Valence. And so now this has become a weird lecture for me because I keep saying her name a whole bunch of times, but I'm not talking about her. Um, but it's kind of fun that way. So if you meet a little girl running around town these days named Valence or Vale, that's probably her. I don't think there's any others in town. All right. Well, have a good day, everybody. We will pick up with this on. Be ready for the quiz tomorrow. Quiz on all the elements. And finish up your Excel lab if you haven't yet. Um, so I have a question about my. Yes. So I have like a 30 Crazy. That's yeah, that's but I'm way behind on grading. Okay, I'm done trying to try to do anything wrong. What's your name? Uh, right, tenacity. okay, tenacity. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm starting to catch up on grading a little bit, but that's probably just like a quiz okay. one quiz that you didn't get a great grade on is is mm -hmm. determining your whole grade as I go in assignments. That'll, okay, cool. that'll come up, yeah. Um, there's like great checks. I don't know when great checks are going to be placed, but that's right. We're getting we are getting close to that. I'm going to be trying to be caught up okay. all the way by the awesome. at least it won't show up like that. Okay, yeah. Um, I had a question about the lab. Yeah, uh, I wanted to know if I have this for 